Okay, so we've come all through all this, and we've got this property called entropy, but so far, I mean, this has a little bit to say about entropy being generated, the quality of energy, but we already kind of knew that. And, you know, it's been applied to the Carnot cycle. So what? The Carnot cycle is not something we can actually build and use, although there are some reversible cycles we will learn about later in the course that are a little more practical and we can approach not complete reversibility, but we can approach reversibility or at least make an engine based on the cycle. Well, remember when we were learning about enthalpy and we learned that enthalpy uh, was a very useful property because uh, air conditioning, for example, we all like our air conditioning. I'm glad I didn't live, you know, 100, 200 years ago when there wasn't such a thing. I like my comfortable life. I like my air conditioning. And one of the, the key things that makes air conditioning possible is throttling valves, right? You, you throttle a saturated liquid refrigerant. Some of it boils off. It cools down a lot. We can use that to cool our cars and our homes and be much more comfortable and probably spoiled today than in the past. And one of the keys to understanding how this thing operates was the fact that the entering enthalpy and leaving enthalpy were exactly equal to another, one another. The, the entering stream didn't lose any energy as it changed its form, as it boiled off. And that is counterintuitive because our intuition says that as temperature drops, well, the system loses energy because we know that's how things usually go. And while that's true, that usually as a system's temperature drops, it's losing energy because of heat transfer. In the case of the throttling valve, we realized that actually enthalpy is a combination of internal energy and flow energy. So all that was happening was a rebalancing act between the amount of thermal energy and flow energy. Now that's a very useful thing to discover. It allows us to make air conditioning, which I think we all appreciate, uh, not only for our comfort, but the fa for the fact that we can sustain larger populations because now we can refrigerate food and transport uh, it around safely without, you know, ending up giving people food poisoning at the end of the line, right? So this is a good thing that we understand this. So what about entropy? I mean, I know that enthalpy probably seemed fairly theoretical at first, but we realize it's pretty practical and very useful. So what about entropy? Well, it turns out that entropy will have a lot to say about all the devices we make. In fact, it has to lot, a lot to say about how reversible they are, they are and therefore how efficient they are. So nozzles and diffusers and compressors and turbines and pumps, there's a lot to learn about them based on this property entropy. You see, these devices work best when there are no irreversibilities. Friction is just one of those irreversibilities. You don't want unconstrained expansion in a diffuser, for example. What will happen is if you allow the, the fluid to expand unconstrained, not in a controlled fashion, you'll end up generating turbulence, which is uh, an indicator of some irreversibility. You would never expect to take that fluid after the diffuser, put it into a nozzle, and get back the exact, exact properties of flow that you had at the entrance to the diffuser. You can't put the two back to back and one simply reverse the other if they're both irreversible or even if one of them is irreversible. And again, this is not necessarily a friction thing, although you know, friction along the sidewalls of a nozzle or diffuser is certainly something that can cause irreversibility. And every real nozzle and diffuser is going to have some friction along the sidewall. So all real devices will have some entropy generation. We just want to minimize that entropy generation. It's best if we design our machines to minimize uh, the entropy generation. So really, we don't want these things to make any entropy because that reduces their efficiency. So what that really means is that we need heat transfer that is very low or close to zero. And we don't want any entropy to be transferred into or out of the system in the process. And therefore, the entropy in and out would be equal to one another. That's the ideal situation. That's what we really want. Now, you might look at this and say, yeah, that sounds good, but wait a second, you've got an air compressor up there with heat transfer out carrying entropy out of the system. You just threw away what you were talking about. Well, it is true that some and the vast majority of air compressors do try to transfer heat out as they perform the compression process. The reason for that is if you think about it, if you compress a gas, it's going to warm up. What do you do with that compressed gas? Well, 99 times out of 100, you put it into a cylinder that's not insulated, right? Or a tank that's not insulated. So you put hot gas into a tank. What's going to happen to that gas in the tank? Well, heat's going to leak out of it, right? That's exactly what's going to happen. You may as well allow the heat to be transferred 
when it is a useful thing. Now notice, we're not transferring heat into the system, we're transferring it out so that entropy is removed and what ends up happening is you end up requiring less energy to drive the system. So what we're really trying to do is keep entropy, entropy from going into the system and sometimes letting it out can be beneficial in the long run. Now understand one thing that happens here is we've, we've done something irreversible. You would never expect to put heat back into the air and it you know cause the the compressor to turn and compress the air, right? So what are we doing here because we are throwing away energy well we're throwing away energy at a time when it is actually useful to throw away the energy because ultimately that energy is going to go away anyhow all right so how do we evaluate entropy changes because every property we deal with we're always interested in changes in that property well we'll start off considering a closed system and write it in energy balance for it. Seems like that everything in thermodynamics begins with an energy balance. So here's our closed system and we realize now that if we allow the system to do a small amount of work, transferring a small amount of heat into or out of it, then you know however much work comes out that's going to decrease the amount of energy in the system. However much heat flows in is going to increase the energy in the system. But we're only going to allow a small amount of this to occur because we need to understand the changes along the way. Now before we had a, a, an equation that said that boundary work is the integral of PDV, but we, cut, we got to that equation by realizing that a differential amount of work done by this piston cylinder device would be equal to PDV. Okay? Similarly, now in this chapter what we've got from the Clausius inequality is that the differential amount of heat transfer for this internally reversible system will be equal to TDS. So we can substitute for DQ and DW by TDS and PDV. What's interesting about this is that the amount of work done by the system goes out. It's a flow of energy in the form of work out of the system. The heat that flows into the system is also something that's happening across the system boundary. We're getting rid of things that are happening across the, the system boundary in favor of properties that are all just properties of the system. So this is a very useful thing to do because now our energy balance looks very different. Notice that I've put the PDV term from work on the right hand side with the DU term and I've replaced DQ with TDS. Now we can write this in total form as is done here. We've got the total entropy change, total internal energy change, and total volume change, but we usually like to talk about things on a per unit mass basis. So let's take the mass of the system and divide the whole equation by it and then that way we've got the per unit mass form of what I'll call from now on the TDS equation. Okay, TDS bad dad joke, but we'll call this the tedious equation because so far it's been pretty tedious to get to this point. Now it's not obvious, but this also works for a open system, even though we're only deriving it for a closed system. Now for an open system we'll need to talk about enthalpy changes, right, because we'll have mass flowing in and out, and so enthalpy is a thing there. And so if we think about the definition of enthalpy, it's really just a combination of internal energy and PV, all of which are properties of the system. So we could take the differential of this equation. Remember from your calculus rules, P times V. If we're going to take the differential of it, we have to have PDV plus VDP. So that's what has been done here. And then we can realize that, well, wait a second, this looks a whole lot like what we have above. Notice the TDS equation that we had for the closed system, DU plus PDV. Well, DU plus PDV is two parts of this DH equation, right? So we could write DH equals TDS instead of DU PDV plus VDP. So what we've done is just kind of cut the middle out of that equation and substituted in the TDS term from above since it would be the same thing. Now if we rearrange this equation to solve for TDS again, we'd have that it equals DH minus VDP. And this will be much more suited to the open system. We end up with two equations, one particularly suited to internal energy changes and one suited to enthalpy changes. Now notice I didn't say one that is suited to closed system and one suited to open systems. Actually what we're doing here is really just trying to relate differential entropy changes two other properties. Some of those properties are sometimes enthalpy, sometimes internal energy. We're interested in both.
and that's why we've got both equations. Both equations are just as good as the other. In fact, often we'll have the option to use one or the other. So please don't think that these equations are only good one for closed system and the other one good for open systems. That's not the case. All right, so we've got these two tedious equations again. Uh, what are we going to do to actually evaluate an entropy change? Because a, a differential entropy change is not really a change. Well, obviously, we'll have to integrate the equations. So let's take this equation first and consider it. If we've got a solid or a liquid, solid and liquids are a little different than gases because there's a couple of things we can do. First of all, we can substitute for the internal energy change as just CDT. Remember, for solids and liquids, their heat capacities uh, don't, th there's not a difference between CP and CV, right? It doesn't matter, it's just the heat capacity C. So we can substitute for DU as CDT. And then for the PDV term, well, if you take a solid or liquid and you heat it up or cool it down, the differential volume change, the total amount of volume changes, really just not that much. So the, the boundary work associated with that or any volume change effect is, is really small. So the DV term can be crossed off for all practical purposes. What that means is we're left with something we can actually integrate. Because the heat capacity C over the temperature T, well, that's just things that depend on temperature. And so we have an integral on the right-hand side between the two states that allows us to calculate an, a finite entropy change for a system that consists of only a solid and or a liquid. Now, a lot of times, the heat capacity will be relatively constant over the temperature range between state 1 and state 2, and we can pull it out of the integral, and then we're just integrating 1 over TDT. Well, we, know how, we all know how to do that. That's just the natural logarithm of T. We evaluate it at the two temperature limits, and here we go. Okay, so this is how we can calculate a finite entropy change for a solid or a liquid. This is a very useful equation for that purpose. Now, okay, I said it's, it's useful, but how? Prove it. How is this useful? Well, let's consider a liquid. What if we have a process that we would like to be isentropic, such as a pump compressing a liquid? Well, if we have a pump compressing a liquid, um, how does this help us? Well, it's a liquid. And we like for it to be isentropic. Why? Well, if it's isentropic, that means it's reversible and it's adiabatic. We don't really expect any heat transfer here, so that, that's understandable. But reversible is a good idea because the pump with less, less friction is the better pump, right? But there's other irreversibilities as well. Pumps can generate turbulence. And turbulence generates friction, if you will, inside of the liquid that's being pumped and therefore loses some energy. And so we want this pump to be as reversible as possible. So how does that relate to this entropy change? Well, we don't want there to be entropy change, right? We want the entropy change to be zero. What does that really mean? Well, if the entropy change is zero, then that means that delta S equals zero, which is the heat capacity times the natural logarithm of the temperature ratio between the inlet and exit temperatures of whatever is being pumped. Well, how do we get zero? Well, the heat capacity is not zero. That means the natural logarithm of whatever the, the temperature ratio is, is zero. Well, that means the temperature ratio must be one. In other words, the inlet and exit temperature would be the same. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that if we have a really good pump, it's going to have a very low temperature change in the fluid flowing through it. So you, could, you don't have to take a pump and measure its performance by pumping you know, water from one tank to another necessarily to compare that to the performance of another pump. Just see which one has the lowest temperature change. Now, sometimes the temperature change is so small that you, you can't measure it reliably. In that case, you, you need some other way. But theoretically, this is a valid way of doing this, right? Because the less irreversibilities there are in the pump, the more the exiting temperature of the fluid, whatever is being pumped, will be the same as it was coming in. When I worked for Banjo Corporation, which is in Crawfordsville, Indiana, for uh, a summer after graduating with my bachelor's degree, I, I worked as an internship there uh, because uh, I was going on to graduate school and I just wanted to make some money over the summer, so I, I worked for them. It was an, a neat experience. They make products for um, agriculture primarily. They have a really good, high-quality product line. They injection mold most of their parts out of plastic, but it's not just any old plastic, it's glass-filled plastic. My, now my understanding, although I'm not particularly familiar with injection molding, is that glass-filled plastics are a little more difficult uh, to form and they wear the molds more and so forth, and so it's a little more expensive. So they had a lot of compar competitors, especially from overseas, and while I was working there, the guy that was, was over me, the lead engineer there, uh, had some valves uh, 
that were from Taiwan. You know, obvious knockoff copies of banjos valves. And he took them and took them apart and put them on uh, the coordinate measuring machine they had and was measuring different, you know, dimensions and uh, was doing this as research to show to customers, look, yeah, you can buy a valve off the shelf that's a tenth of the price of ours, but number one, it's not glass-filled plastic and so it's going to change temperature quite a bit with operation. And obviously out in the farm field, that's not a good idea, right? Sometimes you got to spray the crops when it's cold, sometimes you got to spray them in the blazing heat. There can be pretty decent temperature swings, you know, in the environment. And so you need a, a valve and equipment that doesn't change size very much because changing size means generating leaks, right? And in the first place, these valves that he was measuring didn't have very good tolerancing and were probably fairly leaky anyway. So he was doing research to show that although banjo valves are more expensive, they're much higher quality and perform much better. While I was there, there was another engineer who was working on pumps, because Banjo didn't just make valves, they also made uh, pumps, and their pumps were primarily centrifugal pumps and uh, glass-filled housings and so forth, uh, similar materials they made their, their valves out of, and he was pumping liquid from one tank to another. He wasn't wasting time, it's not, he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't know this, he was actually measuring uh, you know, pump curves and so forth to generate for his customers so that customers would know, well, if I need a pump that can generate a certain pressure at a certain flow rate, this pump will be adequate. So I've never forgotten that, but I often wondered, and I didn't ask him at the time because I really didn't think about this. I understood it, but I didn't think about it. But I wonder if he was measuring the temperature change across his pumps versus competitors' pumps as well while he was moving fluid from one huge tank to another. I know that he had two very large tanks. They were essentially the size of a room in a small house. Uh, so he was pumping a whole lot of liquid. And these aren't pumps that could do it in you know five minutes or something. He was doing this for hours or days. I think he was trying to get them to steady state. And I suspect the reason was partially so that he could measure a temperature change. But obviously, I don't know that. What about ideal gases? So moving beyond uh, liquids and uh, solids, what about entropy changes of ideal gases? Well, for an ideal gas, we're interested in both equations because since an ideal gas can change size significantly, uh, we're certainly more interested in both equations for that than we were in the case of liquids or uh, solids. Now, there's a couple of substitutions we'll make, first of all, in the upper equation. For internal energy changes, we can substitute CVDT. And since we're talking about an ideal gas, and we, we can replace P with RT over V. Now, something interesting happens when we make these replacements. The first term looks a lot like what we had in our solids and liquids uh, analysis of entropy changes. However, the second term has some nice cancellations. Notice that the temperature drops out of the equation and we've substituted for pressure. So all we're left with is R dV over V. And that's something we can integrate because R is a constant and dV over V is just a 1 over x dx type of integral. A natural log uh, is the result. So if we actually integrate this, the first term needs to be integrated. And since the heat capacity does actually depend on temperature, then we need the, the ratio of that heat capacity as a function of temperature to temperature. It's not CV times temperature. It's CV, the, the constant volume heat capacity, as a function of temperature divided by temperature. That's what needs to be integrated. And then the second term is pretty easy. It'll all just end, it will always just end up being our natural logarithm of the volume ratio between the two states. So we can calculate entropy changes for ideal gases if we can just integrate the uh, constant volume heat capacity of that gas over temperature uh, as it, uh, the, the, the process progresses. On the other hand, we can write dH equals CPDT Right, we can substitute for dH, the differential enthalpy change, and we can rearrange the ideal gas law yet again to solve for specific volume and make those substitutions in the other tedious equation. Notice we've divided out the temperature, so I guess I have to call it the DS equation now. But then all we're doing really is integrating these two terms, and the right-hand term is pretty easy, right? The right-hand term uh, is just our natural logarithm P2 over P1. Of course, there's a negative sign that comes along for the ride. But it's just a 1 over PDP integral, and that's just natural logarithm. So that was easy. And since we substituted for DH, we've got uh, CP, and the heat capacity at constant pressure will depend on temperature. So again, we'll have this integral to deal with. But notice that that substitution of the ideal gas law got rid of the temperature, it got rid of the specific volume, and gave us DP over P, which is very convenient.
Now, both of these equations are equally useful. You, if you're looking at this and you're saying, well, which one's the right one for ideal gas? The right one is whichever one works. I mean, you, whichever one's easiest for you. They will both give equally correct results. Just pick your, you know, take your pick. Now, a lot of times we really don't want to perform any integration, and the heat capacity won't change with temperature very much between the two states. And so a lot of times we will simply assume that the heat capacities, both CV and CP, are constant, and they simply come out of the integral. If that's the case, it's a 1 over T dt game now, right? Another natural logarithm uh, evaluation, and that's, that's easy. So very often we will simply approximate entropy changes of ideal gases by these two equations and use whichever one is more convenient. Now there are restrictions on these equations, and we really need to start taking uh, note of the restrictions uh, on the equations that we've developed. Number one, this only works for ideal gas. You can't apply this to a solid or a liquid just like you can't apply the ideal gas law to a solid or a liquid. We have invoked the ideal gas law. We've massaged it into the equation if you want to think about it that way. It's, it's part of the, the DNA of the equation now. It's not coming back out. Also, these two equations on this particular screen only work when we're talking about constant heat capacity. When the temperature change of the process between states 1 and 2 is small, and therefore the heat capacity is roughly constant.